Hello, I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology, and welcome to this episode. I got a special guest on today by the name of Jeff Hawkins. So, Jeff, are you there? I am here, Ron. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And uh, let's just get right into it, because he has some very interesting stories to tell. Uh, one of the more notable ones is the volcano ads that Jeff did for the Church of Scientology, which were a spectacular hit. And they sold tons of books. And uh, I'd just like to get right into it, Jeff. So you want to, well, actually, I'll tell you what, before we get into that, why don't you tell us how you got interested in Scientology? This is always of interest to people who have never been with the church or, or have been with the church. So could you give us a little background on that? Uh, sure. Uh, I was um, living in L.A. Uh, 1967. Uh, I was working as a commercial artist in L.A., and I was living up in Sierra Madre Canyon, which was a uh, kind of a hippie art community place. Um, and somebody came out from the L.A. org. In fact, it was. Um, uh, what's his name? The name will come to me. Uh, a, a kid came out an FSM came out to the canyon and started talking to people. And I didn't uh, I, I didn't hear him, but some friends of mine heard him. Yeah, Jeff, hang on a second, because I'm, I'm trying to get this so we can make sure that people listening to this are getting all the words we're saying. When sure. you say FSM, what, what does that mean? Could you just explain that, please? It's a field staff member. It's a, a salesman, basically, who's not, okay. not on staff, um, but he goes out and gets people into Scientology, onto courses, and then gets a commission for that. So he's a commissioned salesman for the church basically okay. I would, yeah um and it was uh mike maurer if you ever heard that name i have i, yeah, have. Phoebe, I haven't heard phoebe that maurer's in years yeah phoebe maurer's son yeah uh, he <clears throat> and he was 16 at the time and he came out to the canyon and talked to some friends of mine and i wasn't there but they were all you know, enthusiastic about it. And we decided to go down to the, to the uh, org, which was on Ninth Street in LA at the time. And I tell you, Ron, there were hundreds of people every night down there at the org. Wow. Hundreds of people, uh, you know, go on course and in the intro lecture, there were like literally a hundred people a night uh, wow. attending the intro lecture. What a difference between then and now, huh? Oh, uh, Totally. Totally. And I don't know, it may have been the times or whatever people were looking for some kind of spiritual thing, but Scientology was just taking off like crazy. And I went to the intro lecture and there were like literally a hundred people there in a big room. And um, the guy was talking about clear and talking about this and talking about that. And uh, it's, it all sounded exciting. I mean, this, and this was before the internet, so we couldn't fact check. Yeah. any of this stuff or look any of this stuff up. We were just taking the guy's word for it, that there was this thing called clear and, you know, that you could, uh, um, you know, experience your past lives and, you know, all the whole track stuff. They didn't hold anything back in those days. It was right. all, all on the line. You know, it was like, yeah. uh, you know, and in fact, one of the first events I went to, uh, the guy played free being the tape free being, Whoa. To raw public. I, I, I heard the tape many times. I know what you're talking about. That's uh, really out reality, as they would say. That's <laughs> beyond the reality of the average person walking the street. Yeah. But we were all kids and we were all, uh, you know, the weirder, the better. We, we were like, yeah, bring it. You know, uh, we didn't care. Past lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. everybody, everybody was into stuff like that. 
uh, yeah. back in those days. They were into gurus or, uh, you know, I Ching tossing the coins or oh, everything. Yeah. So nothing was off limits and everybody and, you know, everybody was uh, uh, didn't have any problem with that stuff. You know, it was kind of like, yeah, bring it on. One of the first books I read was um, A History of Man. Good Lord. One of the first books. Jesus. And the but... and the, the, the bookseller was like, No, no, you don't want you don't want that one. That's for advanced people. And I said, No, I want it. Give it to right. me. There you go. <laughs> oh boy. So um so I got into <clears throat> it and it was very exciting. A lot of my friends got into it. And um and we were off and away. I got got some training, got to be a class zero auditor. Um you know, so it all seemed good there. And there was I wasn't aware of any abuse or anybody being mistreated at the time. Right. You know, uh, it, it all seemed to be positive. So I, I just went for it. You know. Well, did, did you join staff then? What, how did you progress, Jeff? Well, I, I, I got <laughs> training and then then I, I, I was really committed to the subject. You know, I was really, really a, a follower. And right. I saw that um, that the pubs org was recruiting, and the 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 brochure said that they were in England. Yeah, and well, org, I, this is the organization that printed all the books, right? Yeah, pubs org worldwide, yeah. and the, it was at St. Hill, right? And um, and and I thought, well, that's terrific because I I had been to England before as a as a student. Right. And I'd hitch, I'd hitchhiked around England, and I loved England. And I thought, well, great, I'll go over there. I'll join staff at the publications organization. I'll live in England. It'll it'll be great, you know. So me and uh, me and two friends, me and three friends, actually, we all decided we're going to go join join Pubs Org, and um, and so we did. We flew over there and joined staff. One of the guys got turned back by customs because he had Scientology books. And yeah. they were turn they were turning Scientologists away at that time. But right. the rest of us, we just pretended to be tourists and and got in. And uh, and pubs wasn't at St. Hill anymore. It was up in Edinburgh in Scotland. Yeah. So we all took a train up to Scotland. It was me and my brother and another guy. Mm. And we joined uh, joined staff up in Scotland. And uh, uh, and then you know about a year later. Uh, pubs moved to Denmark because they were going to, the UK was going to confiscate the book stocks is what we were told. I got it. Yeah. Like, like they did in Australia. So we moved all the book stocks and everything over to Copenhagen. And I was in Copenhagen for maybe six years, something like that. No, I, I didn't know that part of your history. Yeah. 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 I, I, I did not know that, you know, but I'll tell you, I have a similar story. When I went there in 1971 to do the clearing course, um, I was carrying a uh, Scientology book in my hand and uh, the custom, the immigration guy wanted to stop me. And I had to fake my way in there and tell him I was just visiting, which of course I wasn't. I was over there to do the clearing course. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to throw me out had I not been able to fake my way through. And it, this, I had a similar story to yours. Just wanted to yeah. mention. That's all. Yeah. 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 So then yeah. continue. What happened then? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I was over, I, I worked for pub with pubs for years. My whole career in, in, on staff in Scientology was marketing, publications, advertising. I was always doing that because that was my background. Yeah. You know, I had been a commercial artist. My father had run an ad agency in, in LA. Um, so I was from an advertising family. I majored in art in college, art and design. Wow. I worked in commercial arts, so I just, that's what I wanted to do. That's, that's all I wanted to do was, was commercial art and advertising and design and that sort of stuff. And they were happy to have me. Yeah. Um, happy to have uh, somebody who could do that stuff, because frankly, all their printed material looked like shit back then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do remember some of the earlier stuff that came out, and it was just like kid stuff. It was like comic book material. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I figured I'd you know, uh, contribute. That would be my contribution. Right. Anyway, then, uh, in 71, I went to the ship as a student. Yeah. Now what, 
How did you manage to do that? What, what happened that got you sent to the ship? Well, they were, uh, they were about to launch the flag executive briefing course at flag. That was when it first started. Right. And uh, Hubbard was going to give lectures. He was going to give live lectures to the class. I got it. And so they were bringing in people from every org. Every org was sending a team of people to be trained at flag. Right. So uh, me and my wife at the time and one other guy were chosen as the pubs team. And so we got sent to the ship, which was uh, in North Africa at the time. So that was all exciting and clandestine and oh, yeah. nobody knew where it was, you know, nobody knew yeah. where the ship was, you know, but, uh, and then we studied on the, uh, on the FEBC Hubbard had given all his lectures by the time I got there. So I just listened to them on tape. I got it. You know? That's the real, real tapes they had, right? Real to reels. Yeah. Yeah. The old real to reels. And how, how long were you on that, Jeff? I was on, uh, I did, the organization executive course and the flag executive briefing course. I was there about five months. Um, and this was supposed, and also they were auditing us on the L's. So this was supposed to be the big deal. This was supposed to be the, the new generation of executives going out to save, save the planet and so yeah. forth. Most of the guys on that program fell on their heads. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was not a successful program, but there was a boom at the time uh, in, in 71, and it was mostly uh, stat pushing. You know, uh, Just, uh, expand on that a little bit when you say stat pushing. Well, you know, they, they collect <clears throat> uh, any Scientology organization collects their statistics. They count their statistics every week at Thursday. Right. And, and, and if it's up, you're cool, you're good. And if it's down, you're terrible, you're awful. Right. And right. You'll, you're, you're penalized. So people get desperate to, to keep those statistics rising and rising and rising so they won't get in trouble. Yeah. And, and this got to be where, this got to be so crazy that there was this team at, at Boston Org. It was Kerry Gleason, Bill Franks, Alex Seversky. Right. And they started this whole thing of postulate checks. Uh, postulate and, check, and that is uh, what? that's where you get a you get the public to write you a check for your services, right? Even they don't have the money to cover it; it's not in their account. But they postulate that by the time the check uh, clears, they'll have the money there. Boy, oh that boy! A, that was a postulate check. <laughs> You don't have the money, but you're writing a check and you're saying by the powers granted to me by some universal subconscious being, I'm going to get the money. Exactly. Exactly. Was horseshit, right? Yeah, it was complete horseshit. <laughs> and so they would, they were, and everybody was like, okay, whatever, I'll write you a bad check. And they would just, they were, uh, the, the, the income statistic was just shooting up and up and up and up and up and every, and they were heroes because oh, the income was going up. And then, of course, the whole thing crashed down, you know, because there wasn't any real money. But uh, and they used to falsify every other statistic. You know, it was just anything that could be falsified, they would falsify. Wow. You know? So that was the 71 boom, really. It was built on falsehoods. OK, now, but you must have had some type of uh, unusual happening on the ship i mean did you ever deal with l ron hubbard when you were there you know i saw him um uh, i saw him a few times uh uh there was one time i was racing to get to course and i had to go to my uh cabin which was on a deck all of the students were on a deck it was like we were treated like vips on the ship right so uh so i ran to my cabin on a deck and as i went through the door there was Hubbard standing with all of his aides in the stairwell. Right. And here am I, this kid, you know, harem scarum kid. I was 21 or something. Come crashing through the doorway and everybody stopped and looked at me like with daggers in their eyes. Right. And then Hubbard says, well, hello there. <laughs> no kidding. 
<laughs> and then everything was, I, I thought was cool. I got in ethics trouble later for running around like a crazy person. But, he, but uh, he, he, he came off larger than life, didn't he? I mean, he had a, a charismatic he was, appearance. He was a, yeah, he was a big man. He was, uh, I think he was 6'1 or something. And he was just big. Everything about him was like if you took a normal person and just, you know, inflated it by, you know, 10 or 20 percent. He was just, you know, a big guy. Yeah. And uh, and he had uh, the ability to command a room if he walked into it. You know, all all eyes would go his way. Yeah, I, I never met him, but I, I've listened to hundreds of his lectures and he was one hell of a speaker also. I mean, I, I can see how this entire thing just kept on moving. Yeah. I mean, you, you can say what you want, but I mean, he he got thousands of people to follow him and around the world, as a matter of fact, we both know that. Yeah. Uh, underlying all this, though, is uh, DNA built in that this whole outfit is not on uh, up and up, if you know what I mean. But uh, we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll do that. But I, I wanted to get your, your history and, you know, the, okay, that was your time on the ship. Now, then, how did you get to the point where you're doing these ads with the volcano? Which, to me, I, I got to tell you, it, these were the more spectacular ads. Excuse me. They were one of the more spectacular ads that I've ever seen in my life. Because even though I was working uh, in Golden Era Productions at the time and doing music for them, every one of them held my interest. Like, how did you pick the questions? Get into this a little bit, Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, basically, um, I was always in this in the marketing area. And I, I got frustrated that we weren't doing more raw public stuff. We weren't reaching out to raw public to new, new people who had never been in Scientology, because everybody was in this stat push mentality of like, um, uh, concentrating on people who were already in Scientology and getting them to pay more and pay more and pay more. And that was the weekly treadmill. And okay. I thought, N what, what you're talking about here is what we would call headhunters. These were people yeah. who would seek out people who were already in Scientology and exactly. try to get them to buy huge courses. So as soon as they started that they could get a big FSM commission. So yeah. It was money motivated rather than getting people uh, newly into the subject. Right. That exactly. And like 99% of the attention <laughs> uh, of management was on existing customers. I got it. And I thought that was wrong. So I basically petitioned to be able to start this big campaign, a book campaign. And mm -hmm. Hubbard was pushing for a book campaign because that was, you know, he was going to get royalties off of that. Yeah, exactly. So he, he, he wanted a big book campaign. So that was good. And so I petitioned and they said, OK. And fortunately, I had enough air cover and enough time to properly put a campaign together uh, rather than just what they were used to. It was like you have two weeks to put a campaign together. Right. Start, you know. And I said, no, that's not going to work. We need at least six months to a year to research everything, to prepare the advertising, to launch it, to research out the publics, the media. I want to do a proper job. And I was studying uh, marketing and advertising, not the Hubbard stuff. I was studying the real stuff, how to do marketing and how to do advertising. Right. Because Hubbard, you know, Hubbard said he knew all about that. He didn't. Uh, yeah. I, his, his experience with advertising was, I think, back in the 30s or something like that. He knew nothing about television advertising or anything like that. So right. I studied it. I spent a year preparing this campaign, which is amazing, by the way, because nobody spends a year preparing anything in Scientology. You know? Jeff, you, you just knocked me over. I absolutely did not know that you took a year to get that thing going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, unless I heard it from somebody else, I'd say, ah, Jeff's lying. Because <laughs> I live there. I know what you're talking about. I'll tell you how it went. We want this campaign. We want it yesterday. And you better have the fucking thing on my desk or you'll know you're yeah. for it. Right? That's how it went. Yeah, exactly. And, I, I and in, late, in later years, it was that way. It was like, we need a Scientology campaign. You have, you know, 48 hours. Right. Yeah. It was ridiculous. But this first campaign, um, 
I had backup from ASI, uh, from Julia Watson and Ken Delderfield and a bunch of the people over there were backing me. And they were giving me all the time and air cover I needed, which was fabulous. Wow. It was, was fabulous. So we prepared this campaign, launched it. Um, in the beginning, we were selling maybe 500 books a week. You know, but, um, but Hubbard, he was not phased by that at all. He said, no, you got to build it up. You got to build it up. You got to continue it. It's not going to just instantly go like that. Right. So we built it and we built it and we built it. Came 1986. And uh, I said, we need new ads. And I started doing my analysis for new ads. And I thought, we got to get people into the book somehow. We got to get them curious about the book. Right. And so I came up with this and initially as a print ad. There was a picture of the book in the middle of the ad and then all of these questions going out from it, you know, with little lines in saying, how can we stop war? Uh, you know, what's the reason for violence? You know, whatever the <coughs> whatever the questions were. Yeah. Pointing into the book. And then I thought, let's do that as a TV ad. So I storyboarded it up and I had the I had three questions, white type on black lettering, and then the book and the explosion and all that. And I showed the storyboards to the execs and they were like, we don't understand this. That's not an ad. That's yeah. not a TV ad. I don't, we don't understand this. So I thought, fuck it. I'm going to go ahead and just make the ad because it was cheap to make. It was just these cards yeah. with a question on it. And then the ending, the explosion, which I already had the video for that. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> so I just edited it together. I went into an editing bay, edited the thing together, and showed it to the execs. And they were like, oh, I get it. Oh, that actually has some impact. <laughs> and then I went to, um... <clears throat> there were all kinds of things with this. See, the thing with advertising at that time, this would have been 86. Right. Everything was bright, shiny, happy music, happy people, you know, Coca-Cola, all this. And I thought, no, let's go the opposite way. Let's make something that is tense and dark and, and, uh, and sucks them in, you know. I yeah. didn't want to make, make something that was all happy. I wanted to make something that was dark, right. you know. So black screen, white letters. And then I, I went to, uh, to Jeff Levin and Chris Maney to, to get the music done. And I was a... Did Jeff come up with that? Yeah. yeah. Was, it, was that a computer-generated thing, or did he actually write that? He wrote that. Because um, wow. uh, I, was, I was listening to a lot of electronic music at the time. I was a big fan of Tangerine Dream. Yeah. And... And I played some of that for Jeff, and I said, this is what I want. I want this staccato tension. I want it to be tense. <coughs> I want it so that, you know, how people get up from the TV and walk into the kitchen when yeah. the ads come on. I said, I want it to be so that they stop on the way to the kitchen and go back and, and go, what's that? Right. You know, just something that would be so, you know, not advertising like, but really tense. So he wrote this music, which I thought was brilliant. You know, this that, 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 that kind yeah. of music. And um, what else? Oh, and we just surveyed the questions. We just surveyed to find out what would interest people. And we put it on. Um, at the same time, I had a, a professional media buyer who I was working with, who was a Scientologist, Jan Gildersleeve. Right. I remember she, the name. Yeah. Yeah. She was very clever. And she said, um, she <laughs> said, I want to talk to you about something new. It's called cable television. And she said, it's very new. It's so new that it's not even rated by Nielsen. You know what Nielsen is? Yeah, of the, course. Yeah. Ratings. Yeah. <laughs> Nielsen ratings. She says, advertisers are not even touching it now because it's not rated by Nielsen. And she said, uh, do you want to buy some cable? And I looked at it and I looked at the demographics of the cable viewers and they were young, uh, mostly male, college educated, and it fit perfectly 
the demographics that I was going for with the Dianetics ads yeah. perfectly. And I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. And she said, um, do you want to do a test? And I said, no, put the whole budget into it. No shit. And she, and she was like, really? And I had that much certainty that it was going to be good. Yeah. And uh, I said, no, let's put our whole budget. We were launching the question ads. And I said, put the whole budget on cable, national cable, because we wow. were not doing anything nationally. We were buying spot markets up to that point. We'd buy LA, New York, you know, and so yeah, forth, yeah, yeah. where there were orgs. This was the first time we were doing a national buy. And I said, take our whole budget, which was not small at the time. We would run uh, half a million dollars in ads, you know, for an ad buy. Wow. Uh, and I said, take the whole budget and put it into cable. I said, I'm willing to make that bet. And so we did. And the book sales just went vertical, just vertical. And hey, uh, give me an idea, like how many books are we talking, Jeff? We went from maybe, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the numbers. We, we had been doing, I think, around 1,500 books a week, something like that. And that had been going on for years, just building, 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 building. Right. right. Put those ads on, it went to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. You know, it was just straight up. I was having to do that thing of adding paper onto the top <laughs> of the graph. Yeah. You know, and, and, and having it go up the wall and across the ceiling. Unbelievable. <laughs> <clears throat> and that was it. We were doing national advertising with that uh, with that question ad, and the book just started flying off the shelves. It was just amazing, and well, that's when we went on New York Times bestseller list, all the all the bestseller lists. That to me is, well, I don't know. I guess that was a phenomenon that I noticed, even though I was within the church at the time. I remember this ad is really clever because. It was what you call come on. In other words, yeah. you're asking a question, and in order to get the answer to that question, you're going to have to get the book and see what <laughs> the answer is. And let's face it, man is a curious animal. I mean, he gets himself in a lot of things out of his curiosity. Yes, and we I, and we and we certainly did. You know, oh, I tell you, man. <laughs> but okay. I had I had stories from booksellers who would tell me that people would race into the bookstore. And say, where's Dianetics? They go right there and they pull it up and go to the page. Get out you of know? here. <clears throat> no, they were seriously. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I'll tell you, as great a story as it is, what then happened to it? Because it disappeared from uh, the television screens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in 80, <clears throat> that, went, that whole campaign was running uh, 80. 86, 87, we were just on top of the world. End of 87, marketing got put under Int. Okay. Uh, under the Int base. And for a year, that's when uh, Ronnie came and he was the head of marketing. He was mar marketing exec Int. Right. And built into. And they took over marketing. Right. And from the minute they arrived, I was in the ship. I was persona non grata. How come? What? What? <clears throat> I couldn't figure that out for years and years. I couldn't figure that out. But but their first action on on taking over marketing was to attack me personally. Wow. Which was amazing to me, and I kept going. What? I'm selling more books than anybody has ever sold for the Church of Scientology, and you're attacking me. I could not understand it. Yeah, and, and you know. I, I didn't know it until this very minute. I did not know <clears throat> that. Yeah. And, you know, they accused me of having an affair with my media director, which was ridiculous. I mean, she's a nice lady, but it was totally professional, you yeah. know. And I was married at the time. So it was, and all of the, you know, that I was stealing money, which I wasn't. Uh, all of these empty accusations. But um, I figured out later where it was coming from. And where it was, was it coming from? It was coming from Dave. When you say Dave, who, who are you talking about? David Miscavige, right? Dave, Dave Miscavige. Yeah. Wow. It was because he hated me with a passion. Wow. From, from the moment I met him 
until the moment I left, he hated me. And I think he hated me because I was doing something he couldn't do. I was selling books, hand wow. over fist. I was selling 30,000 books a week. And he couldn't do that if you gave him 10 years to do it. And of course, he hasn't since then. No. Um, so uh, he, wanted, he wanted that campaign shut down. And he did. And he said it was a waste of money. Um, because it was costing us more to sell a book than we got back in profit from the book. Well, of course it was. Yeah. Because you don't make your money on that first book sale. You make your money on the people coming into the orgs. Of course you do. And, and they were coming into the orgs in record numbers. Orgs were booming back then. Wow. Uh, the the mid-80s, right up to 89. And then the campaign was cut in half in 80. In 1990, and in 1991, it was shut down. And you can mark that on the on Scientology graphs. Wow! And the the orgs were going up, 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 up. 91 down, 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 down. And when I left, it was still going down. The instats. Wow. Uh, that so that was from uh, 91 to 2005. It was just a death slide down, 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 down. And you could mark 1991, the year that they canceled that Dianetics campaign. Well, I'll tell you something. I, these are things that I didn't even know. And I was involved in the church. I worked for the church at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. So uh, that's built into the DNA, I guess, the, to cut your own throat in that church. You know, look at, let's face it. Here, join the Church of Scientology. Come on in and uh, go to confession. We'll have a voice recorder. We have a digital camera. And then if you ever leave, we're going to put it on uh, on the Internet and, you know, tell everybody what you told us in private. And this this is how they operate. It's, yeah. and it's, it's, it's <clears throat> the yeah. most upper end day, you know. But anyway, then how did you get out? What what happened that, that you got you to leave? Or did you get kicked out or what? What, what happened, Jeff? Well, uh... <laughs> I, I was constantly in trouble because, <clears throat> like I said, uh, Dave Miscavige hated me. He didn't want me around, um, but he needed me uh, because I was the only one who could put together a campaign or write sensible ad copy. Right. You know, so I was writing all the copy. I was putting the campaigns together. Me and a couple other people who were also out, like Steve Hall. Right. <clears throat> were the only ones who could put campaigns together. So I kept getting offloaded because he'd get pissed at me. And then I'd get brought back because there was nobody else competent enough to do, to do the ads or to write the copy. And this went on and on and on. I was offloaded four times. It's all in my book. Wow. Um, the whole story. So what, what is it, Jeff, what's the name of your book for our listeners here? Counterfeit Dreams. And how can they get this book? Uh, if you go to Amazon and just uh, look up Counterfeit Dreams. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> um, so, uh, anyway, yeah, I was getting offloaded, this and that. And, um, and finally, I got sent out to the OGH. You know what OGH is? It's like the the prison within the prison at the ant base. That's the <clears throat> old Gilman's house. Old Gilman, Gilman house. Gilman Hot Springs was the name of the international base before Scientology bought it. Yeah. And it was, uh, that, that was Gilman owned it. So this was old Gilman house. And that's where people went. I guess that was purgatory. And then <clears throat> exactly got kicked, kicked out. <clears throat> so I was, and then I was getting security checking uh, for months and months. And mostly what they were asking me is, have you ever committed an overt against Dave Miscavige? Right. <clears throat> on and on and on. So finally I got to the point where I could float my needle, you know, yeah. and just say, no, no, he's a great guy. He's a wonderful guy <laughs> and get out of there. Yeah. Good Lord. And then, and then I was, uh, I was offloaded at that time. And then uh, when, when, when was this that you got offloaded, Jeff? 
This was in April of 2005. All right. And then uh, what happened to your life after that? <laughs> well, I, I didn't have any friends outside Scientology. I mean, I didn't think I did. It turns out I had a lot of friends outside Scientology, but I didn't know that they were out there. Right. So, so I'm, as far as I was concerned, I had no friends outside Scientology. I had no family outside Scientology. My brother was still on lines um, and was living in Clearwater, actually. Um, and I was told I could not talk to him. And I didn't want to mess him up, you know, so I, I, I was going to respect that. <clears throat> so, and I had a little money. I had some money left over from my mother's estate, a couple thousand dollars, enough, to, I figured, to live for four or five months in a right. pinch. Right. So I, so I, I drove up to Santa Barbara, mainly because it was the opposite direction to the base, you know. Yeah. And, and my mother used to live there. So I just drove up to Santa Barbara, checked into a motel. I was essentially <laughs> homeless and jobless. Wow. And I always, I always thought that Scientology would help resettle people. I was naive. Yeah. No, no. They gave me $500 and uh, kicked me out. <clears throat> and that was, and, and I was on my own, 58 years old. And how old, uh, how many years had you spent in the church? Thir about 35 years. Jesus so I'm, ki I'm kicked out with nothing. I have really no social security because of many years of being paid nothing. Yeah. You know? So, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so I went up to Santa Barbara, started, uh, I got a, an apartment up there yeah. within about a week. Uh, I, I closed on an apartment, um, to rent and, and you know, I figured I could stay there for a couple of months before my money ran out. And I started job hunting and I, I decided I wanted to get back into graphic design and, and art and so forth. So I started looking for jobs. Uh, it took me five weeks and I got a job as production manager for a weekly magazine in Santa Barbara. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I was, uh, you know what, uh, Adobe Photoshop and Adobe InDesign and Adobe right. Illustrator, those programs, or they're like the workhorse programs. I was not that familiar with them because I'd spent the last many years writing copy. Right. So I, I studied the manuals and practiced every night on those programs for that five weeks, uh, just getting better and better and better at Photoshop and at, at InDesign so that by the time I got that job, I, I knew those programs cold. And then I worked there for two years. Wow. Um, uh, putting the magazine together. And I'll tell you the funny thing. <clears throat> At the Int Base, we had been trying to put together a brochure, a 16-page brochure right. for, um, for the basics, what they called the basics later on. It was called the Milestones when we were working on it. Right. I remember that. We had been working on this 16-page brochure for a year. <laughs> And I and I, I I had been I had been offloaded and then I was gone for four months and then I was brought back. They were still working on it. Yeah. <clears throat> it was like time had stood still. We had a stack of pages. Sixteen pages. Sixteen pages. We had a right. stack of rejects this high. Right. And every time we submitted one, you know, Dave Miscavige would come down and slam it down on the on the, the, the flat files in marketing where he used to ha hold meetings for us, and slam it down. And this is shit. This is horrible. And, you know, you guys can't do anything and so forth. And this was going on and on and on 16 pages. <clears throat> I get this job and we're producing a 55 to 65 page magazine, color magazine, big format every week. Wow. And it was a piece of cake. I was working nine to five. And I was also ha wearing another hat of the art editor. So I would go out and interview artists and uh, interview gallery owners and write up the shows and this type of thing. And put the entire magazine together, design it, lay it out, design all the ads every week wow. <clears throat> for a 60-page magazine. And it was easy. This and I'd go... It shows you when you don't have that stress and personal abuse on you as an individual 
and you're a free being, you can accomplish almost anything. Because right now, then you have a very successful business where you produce websites for people. Is that right? Yeah, I do websites. I do uh, logos. I do uh, company branding. <clears throat> anything they want. Posters, trade show booths. I do any kind of graphics that people want. I just am getting into motion graphics now and uh, animation. You know, so uh, whatever, the, whatever the customer wants, I can do. This is fabulous, man. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm really happy for you, Jeff. And, um, boy, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Just let me mention a couple things before I end off. Um, if you like these programs that I'm doing, you can go on to Patreon and contribute any support you'd like to it. Uh, also, my website is called therealronmiscavige.com. And you should go there if you want to catch up on what I'm doing and follow these because uh, the church in all the goodness of his heart bought 500 iterations of my name. And if you go just about any other variation of my name, you're going to get a hate site on me. Uh, well, you know, it's normal operating procedure. Um, so it's the real Ron miscavige.com. Anyway, um, I've enjoyed myself talking to you, Jeff, and I'm really happy that you come on. And uh, well, maybe- thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, it's been great. Pleasure. And remember, his name of the book is called Counterfeit Dreams. And you can go on to Amazon if you'd like to get a copy of it. And uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it very much because it's, well, Jeff's an excellent writer. I don't have to say that. You heard him talk. So he's, he's good at just about everything he does. Anyway. That's it for now, and uh, I'll see you on the next episode. I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. Thanks for tuning in. See you in the future.